Cyberpunk 2077 is a game set in a world that is full of violence, theft, and, well, other things. And after the success of my two previous entries, I've now been set the task to see if I can bring us back to some good old biblical morals. And that is why we are answering the following question. Can you beat Cyberpunk 2077 without breaking the Ten Commandments? My last two entries in the series have both been very successful. In fact, to this very day, people are still trying to remind me that being Dragonborn is a gift from Akatosh, because the first billion times hasn't helped it sink in properly. So what we're going to do is that we're going to quickly go over the Ten Commandments, and then go over some tangible rules that we need to follow in the context of the game we're playing. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Number five, honor your father and mother. Number six, thou shalt not murder. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. Number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness. And number 10, you shall not covet. So now we're going to create some rules that will specifically apply to Cyberpunk 2077 in order to meet these commandments. I'm going to first create some rules that I must follow in order to pass. I'm then going to create some bonus rules to add some extra fun to the challenge. Here are the rules we must follow in order to complete the challenge successfully. Rule number one, don't be positively affected by anything linked to a false god. Rule number two, don't say the Lord's name in vain. Rule number three, don't say anything that dishonors your father or mother. Rule number four, don't murder. Rule number five, don't sleep with a married person. Rule number six, don't steal. And rule number seven, don't lie. Some of you might notice that there's no Sabbath day rule in here. And this is because even though the game has a day night cycle, it doesn't seem to have a calendar system for what I can find. So I'm just not going to worry about this one because it will just be impossible to track. And I'm just going to assume that it's forever Monday looping over and over. Now for the bonus rules. Number one, don't kill. Many of you in the previous two videos I've made have repeatedly pointed out that the sixth commandment says thou shalt not murder, and that the King James version that says thou shalt not kill is an incorrect translation. However, I've already tried to explain this, but I feel like I've not made it clear enough. I am already aware of this, but I don't want to limit the challenge to just murder, because otherwise I'd feel like I'd be able to get away with any sort of killing, because most of them would be in self-defense. The second bonus rule is no non-lethal takedowns. There's a lot of ways that you can take down enemies that don't actually kill them per se. But I feel like this also cheapens the challenge because it just means that you could get through most of the game without killing this way. So that's why I'm also going to try and limit the amount of times that I do this, unless it's absolutely necessary. And the third rule is beat the game on the hardest difficulty. Nah, I'm just kidding. I said I wanted a challenge, but I'm not insane. So without further ado, let's start our journey. When starting the game, I pick easy difficulty. An attempt to beat this game on the hardest difficulty without killing has already been done by Abraham Sandwich. And since I have to abide by the same thing as what's in that video, and many more rules on top, I felt like I had to do this on the easy difficulty for the sake of my own sanity. When picking life paths, it seems that the only one we can get away with picking is the corpo path. As a street kid, it states that the law of the jungle is the only law you have yet to break, implying that our character has already broken laws like killing and stealing before we even joined. As a nomad, it states that you've looted scrapyards. In most places, in order to take stuff from scrapyards, you have to buy from it. So if our character has looted from scrapyards, it's most likely stealing. As a corpo, it states that we've bent the rules, exploited secrets, and weaponized information. These are very morally questionable statements, but they're probably just about vague enough for them to have not directly broken any commandments. For that reason, Corpo is the path I pick. I use a randomizer to pick my character's appearance. I then choose to increase his technical ability, cool, and body. The game forces your character to be called V, which means that unlike other runs, we're not going to be able to give our character the name Christian. We get given a job and need to go to a place called Lizzie's Bar. We then meet up with Jackie. Some bad looking guys confront us and tell us to surrender the shard that we were given. Jackie then stands up for us and manages to save our life. And it's here that the challenge run already fails because a montage cutscene plays and during this cutscene, we both kill and steal. The one where we kill also doesn't look like self-defense. So both commandments are already broken and this challenge is already 
a mission fail. If that's all you wanted to know for the answer, congratulations, you got it. You don't have to stay anymore. You can go now. Bye. Ta-ta. Adios. But if you want to see how little we can break the commandments, feel free to keep watching. We reach the point where we have to stealthily knock out a guy. Avoiding having to do non-lethal takedowns seems pretty inconsequential at this point, but I'm still going to try keeping it to a minimum. So I end up punching a couch to get the guy's attention so that he and another guy tries to kill me. Jackie eventually manages to kill them both while we watch. The rest of the enemies were a real pain and it took me nearly an hour of waiting before Jackie managed to kill them all, after all of the times he got knocked down and got back up. The last enemy with the minigun was pretty easy though, since if we distract him, Jackie is scripted to kill him. When we go into the room, we automatically break commandment number three, because the moment we enter, V says that. I tried everything, from throwing a grenade at myself, overlapping it with other dialogue, and many other things. But no matter what I tried, V refuses to wash that filthy mouth of his! So commandment three has now officially been broken. We rescue Sandra and give her to Trauma Team so they can help her recover. We then have a driving sequence where we have to shoot enemies chasing us, but by doing nothing, the game is scripted to let us continue regardless, so nothing is exactly what I do. After that, we finish a hard day's work and go to sleep. We then meet the Ripper Doc. We tell him we'll pay him later when we ask for his help. At some point, I need to follow through on this, because otherwise this will be stealing. We've already stolen once in a cutscene, but as I said before, we're going to try and cut this down to a minimum. We then go to meet Dexter. He tells us about the big job, but wants us to get some small jobs done first. We then head to Lizzie's bar. We then talk to Evelyn. She gives us important information on how to steal the relic. She then introduces us to Judy. Judy then gives us some brain dance footage, which is basically a video of a robbery. We then get given another one so we can find out some important information about the hotel we're going to be doing the heist in. We use the footage to figure out where the relic is. We now need to get a tech bot which will aid in the heist, and the only way to do this without causing a fight is by paying 10,000 credits. Any other route we take will result us in fighting someone. I'm sure there's a way to do one of those paths without killing anyone, but I choose to make 10,000 credits to avoid that scenario altogether. The problem is that most of the means in which I can make credits involve either killing or stealing. I decide that it's better to break reality than break the commandments any further, so I resort to using a duplication glitch to get tons of credits. We then talk to Jackie and go to meet the gang. We meet a guy named Dum Dum. Your name, Dum Dum. He tells us to sit on the couch, but Jackie insists on standing. I tell Jackie to sit down to ensure that a fight doesn't start. Upon trying to retrieve the tech bot, they tell us to pay, but when we say it's already been paid for, a man named Royst insists that we pay twice. We agree to do so and pay him the 10,000 credits. Since Militech aren't made aware of the operation, we're able to make our way out without any conflict occurring. We tell Dex the good news over the phone and unlock the heist mission. Before we continue, however, we wait two days, then do the duplication glitch to make more credits. Then we pay off our debt to Victor, which is 21,000 credits. That way our promise to pay him back is not a lie. We then buy some implants from him, including the fortified ankles which allow us to do a charge jump. Look, I'm sorry, alright? But there's no commandment that says thou shalt not mess with the fabric of reality. I also went to another Ripper dock and bought the epic version of the optical camo so I can become invisible for 15 seconds. Then I finally start the heist. When we arrive at the hotel, we need to make sure not to pick dialogue options that require me to tell a lie. After Jackie walks through with military equipment, I simply say nothing when the guard asks why. When we get to the receptionist, I have to avoid picking the first option, since that makes us tell a lie when we say we will meet Taki ourselves. Picking the corpo option doesn't require us to lie, but it's very mean. So I tried staying silent, and it turns out T-Bug gets annoyed but then sorts out the situation for you. What the hell, V? I said stall! Do I gotta do everything? We head straight to the hotel room and manage to use the flathead successfully. We then wait a few hours and head to Yorinobu's penthouse. We then manage to successfully steal the relic we're looking for. As you can guess, this is another instance in which we're forced to steal. Unfortunately, right after, a bunch of guys enter, including Saburo and his son Yorinobu. Yorinobu kills his father, but frames it as a poisoning and then puts the hotel on lockdown. T-Bug tries to contact us, but she gets caught, and we have no choice but to listen to her pain, as her brain gets fried remotely by Arasaka. 
but that's nothing compared to the pain I felt when I listened to V say the Lord's name in vain again. Security spots us, and we have to jump off the roof before getting killed. Now I have to find a way to get past a bunch of enemies without killing them, so I attempt to sneak past them. It is here that I remember that the stealth system in this game is astoundingly easy. To be fair, I did pick the easiest difficulty, but I never fail to be amused by the video game logic of a guard always assuming that they're imagining things if they don't see an enemy for longer than five seconds. It's also funny that Jackie simply doesn't exist in their eyes until I've been spotted. There was a bit of a challenge with one of the cameras blocking the elevator that ends up being locked. I actually completely forgot that I had the ability to turn off the cameras thanks to the hacking mechanics in the game. And I don't remember for the entirety of this escape, but it didn't matter as it ended up only requiring a bit of timing to avoid getting spotted and moving out of sight. We now need to search an Arasaka guard with authorization to use the elevator. In the end, I was forced to use a non-lethal takedown since there doesn't seem to be any pickpocketing in this game, but I already broke the no-killing rule. I then had to resort to stealing the card. Despite the guards being more alert after spotting the body, I managed to get in the elevator, albeit with some difficulty, without being spotted. I then get spotted and shot a ton when entering the next elevator, but I managed to get into the car to complete the mission without being killed. I am then forced to kill some drones, but since they're just robots with no sign of sentience, I don't consider it killing. Jackie then dies, but I replace the cutscene with the one I consider canon, which is where a gun gets stuck in his head. I return to Dexter, but sadly he betrays us and we don't get to collect our cut. He shoots us in the head and we experience the flashback for Johnny Silverhand. I reach the point where I have to kill a bunch of people using a turret on the helicopter. Since I'm doing this in a flashback and I'm not playing as V, I am choosing not to count this. There isn't much to say about the rest of this part, since I had free reign to do the flashback mission normally, since we're not counting any of the actions happening in this part. I do all the parts of the mission I'm asked to do, and reach the part where V wakes up. We try to crawl to safety, but we get dragged by Dexter, who gets killed in front of us by Takamura. We later get attacked by a bunch of people on motorcycles, and Takamura asks us to shoot them. If we don't shoot them, we actually do die in this section. Thanks to Abraham Sandwich's video on this, I know that I can get past this part of the section without killing by shooting the motorcycles without shooting the people on them. Well, at least it's not considered killing by his own definition. But this is where I have to disagree. The thing is, the motorcycles explode as a result of our shooting, which is ultimately what kills the two of them. Since we do something that directly results in them dying, I choose to disagree with his justification, and I count this as two kills. We have the option to shoot an assassin with a gun, but I just do nothing and let the gun get taken out of my hand. We get taken to Victor, and he patches us up. He then informs us that we have a personality construct in our head, and that we experience the memories of Johnny Silverhand, and that we also have only a few weeks left to live. We get taken home by Misty and get some rest. We then get woken up by Johnny Silverhand. He basically tries to kill us, and we take the med blockers to prevent him from interfering anymore. We wake up, and Takamura tells us to meet him at Tom's diner. I first collect my vehicle from my parking garage. It gets damaged, and I have to wait for the car to be repaired, so I meet Takamura in the meantime. I talk to him, and he asks us to help get revenge on Yoronobu, and I tell him I'll think about it. Revenge is wrong, but there's sadly no option to say no. Since my car still wasn't repaired, I had to run all the way to where Judy is located to talk to her for the next part of the mission. We ask her where Evelyn is, and she eventually tells us where we might be able to find her. And unfortunately, when we arrive at the building we're likely to find her in, we're forced to pick someone to be our doll. Essentially a person that is made to fulfill someone's deepest desires. Thankfully, we're able to use the safe word immediately to stop the session from happening before anything even begins, since we have no time for that codswallop, and refuse to be tempted by the sins of the flesh. I then ask the person about Evelyn. She suggests we speak to someone called Tom in the VIP area. We need authorization to get in there, but I simply wait for someone to come out and speak to an angry customer. I then quickly run in before any of them have the chance to stop me. I then manage to sneak past all the guards up there and speak to Tom. He tells us to find Mr. Woodman, who is in charge of all the dolls. With the help of the hacking ability to turn off cameras, I managed to sneak past all the enemies after a little difficulty. It turns out that despite the fact that I got to this point without killing anyone, the game acts like I did, and Woodman refuses to negotiate with me, and I'd have to kill him. So I end up having to load an older save and sneak my way in through the intended route. I use my technical ability to break into Evelyn's booth, which is booth number 11, and investigate what happened. I then have to perform a non-lethal takedown on one of the guards when he's about to take a leak and steal his VIP access card. We then talk to Tom in a similar fashion to how we did before. I am then able to easily sneak into Woodman's office, and he's no longer afraid of us when we try to enter. We ask him about Evelyn, and then offer to make a deal. We can pick the corpo option to persuade him to give us the information 
information we need, and he tells us to find a ripper dock called Fingers. We then head to our next location, but end up feeling the effects of the chip in our head, and we have a conversation with Johnny. After that conversation finishes, we call Judy to tell her what's currently going on, then go to where Fingers is. I encounter some guys, and they ask me why I'm there. If I say I want to see Fingers, they ask me why, and I either have to lie, or say it's none of their business, which will provoke them into attacking me. If I simply say I don't want any trouble, they'll instantly let me pass through, meaning I don't have to kill or lie. We ask some of the patients if they saw Evelyn, and they say they did, but don't know if they're still here. I then have a few options that will help me cut in front of them in the line. One of them requires lying, one requires attacking, or we can just wait. But I choose the most moral option, which is to pay them to see a better Ripper Doc. We speak to Fingers and ask him about Evelyn Parker. We also call him out on the fact that he installs faulty implants. I decide to be diplomatic towards Fingers in order to find out where Evelyn is, instead of punching him, even if it's easy to argue that he deserves it. But when Judy slaps him and tells him off, we side with her and make it clear to him that what he's doing is wrong. For the next part of the quest, I have to go to a shop and speak to a vendor, and in order to find out the location of the guy I need to meet, I have to say something that's arguably a lie. So after I find out the location, I load an older save and just go straight to the guy I need to meet and skip that part altogether. I then enter Judy's van and we use the brain dance to figure out the location of where it was recorded. We manage to find out it's likely to be at a particular power plant. We then exit the brain dance. We travel to the location with Judy. I need nine technical ability to get through the door. And thankfully, I have enough attributes to go beyond that point. I then manage to sneak into the building without alerting anyone. I sneak down to the lower floor and my technical ability once again comes in handy. Judy creates a distraction and tells me to quickly take out two guys but I can ignore this and continue sneaking down. Finally, we find out where Evelyn is. We unplug a cable from her and use the elevator to get out of the building safely. We then have a quick conversation with Johnny. After getting Evelyn to safety, I eventually find out that I need to get to some guys called the Voodoo Boys, which for some reason sounds like a boy band you can commission on Fiverr. After talking to Mr. Hands, I eventually realise I have the ability to get Jackie's motorbike instead of waiting for my car to be repaired, by just having to attend his funeral. <clears throat> I, I'm, I mean, obviously the reason I attended the funeral was to mourn a friend that was very dear to me. Annoyingly, my car just so happened to get repaired a few seconds before completing the quest, so the entire thing was pointless. But at the very least, I went from zero to two vehicles. I then wait a couple days, save my game, reload that save, and that causes Mr. Hands to call me back. I heard this part was still very buggy, so I was thankful that I didn't have to perform some crazy workaround to trigger this part of the quest. I make my way to the chapel, wait a day, then meet someone at the chapel. I then go to the butcher shop and meet someone called Placide. He gives us a job and we go to the mall that he points us to. I manage to easily sneak to the van and I use my jump boost to take a shortcut to the cinema where the agent that I need to find is located. I talk to the agent and since Placide stabs us in the back if I don't side with him and also uses me to kill the agents, I choose to side with the agent because otherwise that would mean their blood is indirectly on my hands. When we return, we meet someone called Bridget. After asking her to help with the biochip in our head, she asks asks us to follow her. We then decide to have a bath, then get some wires plugged into us, and find Bridgette on the net. Huh. That rhymes. We then flash back to being Johnny again, so the killing or any other behaviour that happens doesn't count towards breaking the commandments, since once again, we're not playing as V. We then speak to someone called Alt, and once the cutscene starts playing, I suddenly get the desire to make myself a cup of hot chocolate. I doubt I missed anything anyway. I come back, only to find myself in the middle of an argument, and she walks out. Time passes, with the relationship getting worse. Then at some point, I get caught a little off guard, and find myself being attacked when I'm in the middle of drinking my hot chocolate. I then get stabbed, and my controller disconnects in the middle of it. Once again, there isn't much to talk about for this section, as we do it how the game intends us to. At the end of it all, it shows Alt seemingly dead. We return to the net to talk to Johnny. He tells us that Alt isn't dead, and that she is in the net, which is why Bridgette wants to talk to her. When we ask Bridgette to hold her end of the deal, and remove the thing from her head, she tells us to touch the black wall. We have a small scene with Alt, and my controller has a heart attack. We talk to her with Johnny, and she says that if we can get her into something called Makoshi, she'll have advanced enough technology to save our life. We wake up from our bath, and have to escape the back street, I mean, voodoo boys. I manage to sneak past everyone until I reach Placide. 
Here I am forced to fight him, and the game won't progress unless I do, so I end up having to sneak behind him and perform a non-lethal takedown, then steal the key to escape the hideout. I then go to meet with Takamura, and after speaking to a man named Oda who refuses to help, we go and see Wakako. She gives us intel on the upcoming parade. Takamura says he will investigate the intel and come up with a plan. I then go to the afterlife for the Ghost Town quest, and meet Rogue and ask her for help tracking down Andrew Hellman, and we have the money to pay her. She gives us a location to intercept him, and says that Pan Am will help us. We call Pan Am, and then meet up with her. She agrees to help me with getting to Hellman if I help her steal her car back. We grab some gear on the way, then head to Rocky Ridge. I do what Pan Am tells me to, and then have to stealth my way past some enemies to get the key to her car. I then have to do a non-lethal takedown to get the key. Abraham Sandwich causes the NPC to get shot by Pan Am and takes the key that way. But I decided not to do this, because not only is it very tedious, but also because avoiding non-lethal takedowns becomes kind of pointless at this point, and also because this method results in a death. So I felt like I had good moral justification to take the easy route. Pan Am suggests we take everyone out, and I say no and suggest that we leave. I manage to easily sneak back to the car, but everyone gets instantly alerted to me when I get back in it. But they give up when I drive a few meters away. Pan Am then says that we can find Nash and get revenge. Revenge is not a morally good thing, even if the person has it coming, so I say no and say to stick to the deal. Pan Am reluctantly agrees, but becomes mad at us for the rest of the trip. After she makes a deal with some people, she says that she needs a drink. We also get a text from Rogue saying that she is pleased that we didn't attack Nash, and rewards us with a car. I didn't even consider the idea of getting rewarded for that decision, so to prove that I didn't make it for the wrong reasons, I never end up claiming the reward. We then discuss the plan with Pan Am. She then tells us to meet her later. Takamura calls us to tell us he's come up with a plan. Do not make me wait. I decide to make him wait since we're closer to the current main mission. We meet Pan Am and she talks about her plan to help us reach Andrew Hellman. We then make our way to her power station and on the way she calibrates us with a turret. We're then forced to shoot with the turret but thankfully only against drones so we don't have to kill anyone. We then set the detonator. She then tells us to press the detonator but I don't and force her to carry the burden of mass genocide instead of us. She then shoots a rocket launcher at the AV. We shoot some more drones with the turret then reach the AV. We find out that Pan Am's friends Mitch and Scorpion are there and and I go to check out the crash site. I run up to the turret and deactivate it, then let Pan Am take everyone out. We manage to find Mitch, but he reveals that Scorpion is dead. We're told that Hellman got taken away by Kang Tao. I get on my own motorbike instead of the ones available so I don't have to steal. I follow the tire tracks, skip having to kill some enemies, and track Hellman at a gas station. I sneak my way in, bouncy bouncy my way to the upper floor, knock Hellman out, and I don't have to sneak out because somehow everyone else managed to kill all the enemies at the gas station. After a heated conversation between Pan Am and Saul, Pan Am tells me Scorpion's bike belongs to me now, and I take Hellman to the nearby motel. When we interrogate him, he says that I can't be saved, but we manage to get him to give us the blueprints for the chip to see if it can help us. When we leave, the chip hurts us again, which leads to a chat with Johnny. After this chat, we go to meet Takamura. We plan how to get Hanako during this parade to speak to her. I convinced Hanako-sama of the truth. We then act out the plan. I'm able to use my jumping ability to jump on top of one of the buildings when sneaking into the industrial park, and I jump across some platforms to get past easily and just barely sneak into the warehouse without getting spotted. I then make my way to the terminal and accidentally Assassin's Creeded an enemy the first time round, but had no trouble the second time. The escape was a piece of cake too. I wait one day, then Takamura contacts us to act out the rest of the plan at the parade. I manage to perform a non-lethal takedown on all three of the snipers. I then have to disconnect a netrunner, but end up having to fight Odar immediately afterwards. I managed to perform two stealth take- <laughs> I managed to perform two stealth takedowns on him, which end up not mattering because regardless of how I defeat him, I have the option to spare him, which I do so. Takamura successfully manages to reach Hanako, and we both escape and I complete the mission. 
We meet Takamura at a hideout, and he tells us to speak to Hanako, and try and convince her about what Yurinobu did. So I try to convince her, but Arasaka finds us in the middle of the conversation and shoots at us. The building ends up collapsing at some point, and Johnny tells us to escape. I decided as a bonus challenge to try and save Takamura. I managed to sneak past all the enemies, and reach the stairs which unlocks the optional objective to save him. I actually got stuck on this section for a long time trying to reach Takamura without getting spotted. And unfortunately, a scripted event makes it impossible to achieve that. And then I completely forgot that I could just bungee jump towards him at the very start, at the place I took the big fool in the first place. The scripted event triggers, but I can just wait on the floor below until they stop being alerted to me. I then manage to do a non-lethal takedown on everyone. I then get spotted while escaping with Takamura, but that didn't matter because I just sprinted out of the building and the cutscene to escape triggered. I then end up at a rundown motel, and then Hanako manages to speak to us through a proxy and tells us that she believes us. She tells us to meet her in person. The chip almost flatlines us on the way. We have a conversation with Johnny, and he asks us to let him have control and speak to Rogue. I say no, since this will lead to a bunch of side quests when I just want to complete the main story, and I also don't want to lie. I then arrive at the place to meet Hanako, and it's here that we reach the point of no return. I speak to Hanako, and she asks us to help expose her brother. We then leave, and the chip almost flatlines us again. We then get patched up by Victor again, and he gives us a pill and a gun. Misty takes us to a spot where we can make a decision. We take the pill, then call Hanako, and tell her we agree to the decision. She then says that she's been trapped into her room by order of her brother, and needs our help to get her to escape and then confront him. After chatting to Misty, Takamura comes to collect me. We then have to help Hanako escape. This section was really frustrating, because not only has the game prevented me from saving, it's also not given me an autosave, meaning every time I mess up, I have to talk to Misty and go through the cutscene in the car again. Thankfully, I managed to get lucky, and for the four people I need to take down, I successfully perform non-lethal takedowns on them on the third attempt. When I speak to Hanako, she even acknowledges the fact that nobody was killed, which I think is a cool little detail. We managed to escape with her, and thankfully we're allowed to save when we land. Hanako then reveals that her father Saburo made a replica of himself, so we go and speak to him. We then attend the Arasaka board meeting, and I give my testimony. When they're not convinced, Hanako uses the replica of Saburo to convince them. Most of the board members then get shot by Arasaka guards, and I let Tanaka take out the attackers. For some reason, two of the guards didn't feel like doing anything and just watched the whole situation happen. And I thought it was pretty shameful that they just sat idly by doing nothing in the hopes that other people would do the work for them. Hanako tells me to go to her brother, but if I kill him, our agreement is terminated. Takamura helps us too. We take the elevator to the upper atrium. Takamura asks us how we should approach this, and I say to be stealthy about it. I manage to reach the next elevator without getting spotted, but when we arrive, we have to take care of Yorinobu's forces, so I just wait for Takamura to do it for me. So it turns out saving him proved to be pretty essential for this route, and I don't know if it would have been possible otherwise. Now we have the boss fight for Adam Smasher. I had such a hard time with this, mainly because I didn't do a good job of planning around it at all, but at the very least, I was able to use everything in my artillery to take him down, because it didn't matter how I chose to damage him. The first phase is pretty easy, because I can run out of sight without too much trouble, and then perform a takedown on him from stealth, which takes out about 40% of his health and instantly skips to the second phase of the fight. From here on out, it was a nightmare, because it took me so many attempts to get past the second phase. This is because he calls in reinforcements, which I'm not able to kill at all, and he also has a missile attack, and none of the cover spots will save me from it. This means I have to constantly run around to avoid getting instantly killed. Eventually, I manage to get to the third phase by hitting him over and over again with a katana, and blindly hope I manage to damage him faster than he kills me. I then reach the third phase, and thankfully I beat it on my first attempt. I do this after running around and dodging his attacks for a long time, and try to pick off his health with a rifle. I then run up to him, and manage to keep circling him and finish him off with a katana. After he's beaten, the rest of the enemies despawn, so I am safe from here on out, and then as always, I choose to spare him. Sorry to those who desperately wanted to avenge a certain someone after watching Cyberpunk Edge Runners, but this is sadly not the video to satisfy your thirst for revenge. Takamura then says he will leave, and we say our goodbyes. I then talk to Yorinobu. I prevent him from committing suicide, and when Hanako arrives, I leave her to deal with him, while Hellman agrees to help save us from dying. We have one last conversation with Johnny, then I wake up after being treated. We get taken to a bed to rest, then later have some tests performed on us. This happens twice, and on the second time, 
we get to call people close to us. We get to call Pan Am briefly, then Victor, and then Hanako, who ignores our call. We then get a montage of us getting tests over and over again. Eventually, Takamura gives us a visit. He informs me that although the surgery was successful, I will die in a few months. But then he tells me I could choose to either have my conscience uploaded and then put onto a body sometime later, or I could return to Night City and spend my remaining months there. I choose the second option to let myself die a few months from now, since the first option made it sound like I might overwrite the conscience of another human being meaning I'm effectively killing them. I say goodbye to Takamura, for real this time, we trigger the final cutscene, and thus ends the game. So how did we do? Not great is the answer, but let's go over it. The bonus rules we completely failed, I might as well have not even put them in the video, because we killed three times, and then performed 14 non-lethal takedowns. But let's see how we did for the rules we must follow. Rule number one was don't be positively affected by anything linked to a false god. From what I recall, we didn't break this one, which means that we've successfully followed commandment number one and two. For rule number two, V unfortunately said the Lord's name in vain twice, so this rule was broken, and we failed to follow commandment number three. For the third rule, we had to not say anything that dishonors our father or mother. Again, from what I recall, there was never an instance to which this happened, which means that we've successfully followed commandment number five. Rule number four we failed. Out of the three kills we did, there was probably two that we could argue were self-defense, but the first instance in which we killed in a cutscene was probably not, and would probably be classed as murder, which means we failed to follow commandment number six. Rule number five was don't sleep with a married person. This was definitely something we managed to follow, which means we've managed to follow commandment number seven. Rule number six was don't steal. From what I counted, we stole about five times, which means that we failed to follow commandment number eight and 10. There was potentially a sixth where we stole Pan Am's car, but that one I don't count as stealing because we're stealing an already stolen property and returning it to the person that owns that property. Rule number seven was don't lie. We had a bit of a hard time with this one, but we managed to follow it, which means that we've successfully followed commandment number nine. This video ended up taking a really long time to edit. Not because it was particularly difficult, but was mainly because I wasn't able to get as much enjoyment out of playing Cyberpunk as I was playing Fallout New Vegas and Skyrim. I'd only played the game once before, but I remember having a good experience playing it, so I don't know why I didn't enjoy it as much this time. I think it's mainly because the story just didn't interest me that much. There were parts of the story I did really enjoy, but overall, I found myself having to take a lot of breaks from this so that I could have the energy to go back to it. I'm still happy I did it nonetheless. If you guys want to see more entries of this, please subscribe to my channel and click that notification bell. I also want to thank Carl, Ashley, and Haya for becoming a Patreon supporter. If you want to support me, you can also become a Patreon for as little as $1 a month. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, and peace out.